Okay, uh, good morning everybody. I think it's quite tough to be the last one, so I, I'm always afraid that I don't have anything new to tell you, but uh, I will try to uh, surprise you with something, and then in the end you can just uh, complain to the organizer why I'm the last one, if I am the youngest one. But this is the life. <laughs> okay, so as you probably know, uh, proteins are fundamental ingredient of living organism. Uh, in order to understand how they can function, you need to understand the structure and you need to understand the, uh, the dynamics. As well, you need to understand the links between the structure and dynamics. However, this protein has additional one fascinating feature and more precisely, uh, so before I will tell you what is this fascinating feature of this protein, uh, I would like to tell you, uh, just to remind you that if you would like to understand the function of the protein, you need to take care about the primary structure. So you need to, I don't know how I, it's, yeah. So you need to think about the primary structure, you need to think about the secondary structure and three-dimensional fold of the protein. However, if you look on this protein, then, uh, you can recognize this future is knotting. So the knotting is very difficult to see by uh, just visual inspection, but as you know, you can just pull the protein, and then you can recognize that it's knotted. Um, so today we know that uh, protein are not only knotted, they can have a different type of the slip knot. So the slip knot is exactly what you have on your shoelaces. When you tie your shoelaces, they are stable, but you can just untie them by pulling in uh, by the terminal. And the second part of my talk will be uh, about the lasso type of the topology that we found uh, recently. However, behind this, there is a, some basic question that I would like to ask. How to characterize entanglement in proteins and what is biological role of entanglement and how a uh, knotted protein can fold? So I think we know a little something about the folding of knotted proteins, so I will just refer what we know up to now, and then I will concentrate on the, some new results that are just published about the function of knotted protein. So, just to remind you, as you probably know, uh, proteins are synthesized as a linear sequence of the amino acids, and then there is a magic trick, they, they need to be uh, fold. So it's a question how the protein can be fold, and what is important for this talk is to know that all proteins are deposited in the protein data bank, because I will just make a few surveys across this uh, data bank. Maybe I can just move it a little that I can see something. So, uh, but to discover how protein can uh, fold and what is the function of knotted protein, then we need to add this additional uh, feature. We need to take care about entanglement. Uh, so, as you all know, there, there is a knot theory. This is a basic tool uh, to classify the knots, but the knots in protein are on the open arc, so that's it's something that you can think. The another approach is the approach of the Alexander grade, but it's not maybe the best, because if you just cut your protein uh, like this, then the function, uh, the protein will lose the function. So I, what I would like to do uh, to understand the how protein is knotted and what is maybe the function of knotted protein, I would like to use the, uh, let's say, old approach with the cutting the protein and the modern approach of the uh, knot theory. So to understand where the knot is located in the protein and see if there is no other hidden knots in the protein structure, we develop with uh, Ken Millet and uh, Andrzej Stasiak and Eric Radvan some times ago, something what we call the matrix model. So the matrix model is the uh, somehow approach of Alexander Great, so you have your protein, and what you can do, you can just clip some amino acids, let's say from the end terminal up to some point, when, the, when I click one more that it will untie it. So I can do the same clipping, so this is what you will see, for example, on the and uh, on the uh, x-axis of this uh, matrix. So I am clipping amino acids from one to uh, one seven, from 276, and then I can see that the knot will disappear. However, I can do the same kind of the Alexander Great approach. I can clip from, uh, from C-terminal toward the N-terminal, and then I can see that if I will clip a 
In this case now, a few amino acids from C terminal up to some point, the knot will untied. So in such a very simple approach of Alexander Great, you can discover that there is where is the minimal core of the knotted protein. However, you can uh, think that maybe clipping just from one side is not enough. Then maybe you can would like to clip from both sides in the same time. And if you clip both from the both sides, that you can discover your shoelaces. If you would like to know if your shoelaces are properly tied, so uh, this is, let's assume this is your shoelaces. It's a kind of the proof that if I will pull, let's assume they will untie it. However, now to see if there is a knot, what you have to do, you have to clip one of this terminal up to some point. Let's say if I will clip to this point, well, that was hard clipping, then you can see there is a knot. So this is exactly what this matrix is telling you. If I will clip a few amino acids from the C terminal, so let's say in this case, up to that point, then you see there is protein is knotted. So with this very simple matrix model, and of course, each time I have to close the termini. So the, but it's somehow uh, obvious we close the termini on the huge sphere. Then we can see that this, uh, uh, we can um, call, uh, that's it's just jumping. Okay, so uh, those protein that has this kind of the matrix, if the corner is full with some color, let's say the green one corresponding to 3-1, we call a knotted protein and we call by letter key. And this, if we have the, uh, the corner is empty, then it definitely has to be a slip knot. And this we will call the uh, by S as a slip knot. So with this, uh, just to remind you now, you can see that protein, membrane protein has a very complex motif. They are composed of 3-1 uh, knot, what you can see here. First of all, the corner is empty. That's implying that has to be a slip knot. Then you see there is a 4-1 knot, and then again, a 3-1 knot. So this fingerprint is kind of the topological uh, fingerprint of uh, complexity of knots inside the protein. But this is somehow... Um, uh, so then if you use this method, then you can scan all the proteins that are deposited in the PDB, and what you discover that uh, some of those proteins, of, of course, the, first, the most complex knotted protein is the 6-1, um, and it's composed of another knot of 4-1 and 3-1. Uh, there is a group of the protein that is 5-2, what Sophie was talking about. This is ubiquitin hydrolase. Uh, however, what is, uh, and there is some other protein with the complex motif. But what is fascinating about this uh, table is that it's telling you that some protein uh, coming from different family, they have exactly the same topological fingerprint. This is a group of the protein that are from membrane. They have a slightly different function, but all they uh, conserve the same topological fingerprint. So now you can ask a basic question why. So there's a two basic questions. Why we have a knotted protein? And why we all the protein are not knotted, as we know from the polymer, that everything should just easy knot. But then you can ask, so as we know that only currently 2% of the PDB is knotted today, so why just 2%? Uh, so this is kind of the basic question, but this table is telling you that some of those, they survive this pressure to be eliminated during the evolution if you assume that knotting is uh, difficult. So uh, what's where I would like to go with this. So you know that ubiquitin hydrolase is a very uh, important protein. It was, uh, uh, it's responsible for the degradation of the protein and for the discovery of this uh, beautiful pathway. Uh, there was a Nobel Prize. Um, additionally, you probably hear from the Peter Bill now that this protein is very common in our brain. So this is also important, it's responsible for some diseases as well. However, what uh, we would like to claim that this protein has a 5-2 node, and additionally, uh, what is the conclusion is that all members of this family conserve the same topological fingerprint. It's composed of 5-2, uh, 3-1, and 3-1. And now what you can have, you can have the human, yeast and flapitarium, three different organisms that are separated by billion years of evolution. However, they conserve exactly the same topological fingerprint, even though the sequence similarity is very low. So currently, uh, I know even that uh, 
you can think, so one basic or crucial thing about knotted protein, as already it was discussed, it is important to distinguish between the shallow knot and a uh, deep knot. So a shallow knot is something what we call, and you probably know already, that you have a just thermal fluctuation enough to untie this protein. A deep knot is something that you have at least, let's say, 10 or 20 amino acids from both terminal, from uh, aminid and carboxyl terminal. So what you could claim is that this is a shallow knot. However, we now currently know there are new protein deposit in the PDB that has this node, it's, uh, this term, the C terminal, it's up to 25 amino acids. So we, we have currently deeply noted uh, ubiquitin hydrolase. So this is one uh, conclusion that maybe they survive for some, uh, to not survive in this case to provide some advantage. And as we hear yesterday, there are not really, uh, the advantage is maybe not to protect protein against degradation but there could be something else. And additional, um, the same kind of the behavior we see in the membrane protein. And in this case, what you can see that the sequence similarity, it's really low. It's something like 6%. So for, if you are not familiar with the, with the methods to predict the protein, so if you have the two, two protein, they have the sequence similarity around 30%. In the CASP competition, you can just easily predict this protein. So this is kind of the basic sequence similarity that if you have this sequence, then you can predict another protein. However, in the level of 6% is something what we will call the novel prediction. So you cannot really predict the protein based, another protein based on the template from the protein with the 6% of the similarity. And in this case, we believe that the node is maybe, or slip node is responsible for taking together all this helix, they have to move when the ions are transferred across the, the membrane. So they have to constantly open and close. And the slip knot loop that is more by 4-1 knot is just handing them together. So um, if you would like know something about the knotted protein, I think we, uh, we managed to, buy, uh, to build a nice server, uh, a knot prot, uh, that is online and it's updated each Wednesday. So for example, uh, this Wednesday we, I found four or five new knotted proteins. So uh, it's, the server is supposed to be without the error because there's not more than 30 knotted protein each week, so I can just easily scan them and check if they're correct. But if you find there's something wrong, just let me know. Um, so then you can, we collect uh, or update all the information about the knotted protein. So you can see there is a three one. There are left-handed, right-handed. There is five, two, six one. There is a small group of the slip knotted protein, and this is the topological fingerprint that it's telling you how protein is complex. It could be very useful to look for the protein that is deep or, sh uh, or shallow, because we're also telling you what is the core of knotted uh, protein and what is the size of, uh, uh, of uh, terminal. And I think uh, really soon we will have the update version with just non-redundant set of the data. So each protein is represented in a very easy way of the matrix model that you can see where is the 4-1 node and you can see all the detail here and as well around the sequence. Additionally, you can see where is the 3-1 node. Uh, it's, yes, that's somewhere, yeah, that is here. And then you can, as well, you can see something on the sequence with the different color. And then you can see uh, this on the structure. So it's easy. So let's just uh, jump for a um, few minutes to a different topic, a folding of the knotted protein. And uh, so just to remind you, uh, I think we all believe that um, small knotted protein, as Sophie said, can be folded. And this problem is somehow, we believe, solved. So we assume that cooperative and increasing degree of nativeness are required for rapid and efficient protein folding reaction. We believe that small globular protein are minimally uh, or minimally frustrated. So the free energy landscape looks like a funnel. So you assume that this kinetic straps are order of a uh, few uh, KT, so that there are not enough to trap the protein in uh, some of those states. So the protein can just fault according how big is this from, uh, millis from seconds to milliseconds, let's say. However, the question that I would like to ask is um, what we can say about the knotted protein. Uh, and so 
how does the linear sequence of the amino acids encode the three-dimensional structure? That is kind of the basic question, and we, there was a nice talk about the prediction of the knotted structure, so this is in the same direction. How likely the knots are formed? If we have just two proteins of the PDB that is knotted, that is kind of the basic question. Uh, what is the sequence of events that leads uh, a protein from unknotted state to the native conformation, uh, which contain a knot? So, Already we hear something from um, Marek Cieplak about this. So as you probably know, it's somehow, it's impossible to use implicit solvent simulation just to fold this protein. So what we are doing, we use the structure-based model. And I know that the structure-based model is not the best sometimes. And we, the structure-based model is criticized because it's minimally frustrated. But it's minimally frustrated from the point of view of energy. But I am not looking on the energy of this protein. For me, the structure-based model is a perfect tool because it's even this tool is showing me that proteins are minimally frustrated from the point of view of energy, but there is a huge frustration due to the topology. So I would like to understand this topological frustration. So just to remind you, this is an old paper, but it was really nice because I don't remember, but there was a great talk, I think, the first day that somebody was showing that there's, and you know that nodes can be divided for the twist nodes and all other. So I believe that all protein there uh, will be found, all nodes that will be found in the protein that has to be a twist node for one basic reason. To fold all knotted protein, you have to make, use the twist uh, um, idea. So you have to make a twist loop that is a native loop, and then you have to, with this, and then what you have to do to fold the 3 1 node, there are two options. Or you can just go directly like this, but this is kind of the entropically not really uh, easy way. But what you can do, you can do your shoelaces idea. So you can do the slip knot, and then you can tie the protein. So this is telling you exactly that you do not make the, first of all, you do not make the random nodes. You make, to make the, to fold the knotted protein, you have to follow very precise move. You have to twist, and then what you have, you, you follow the Rada Meissner move. So you, you twist, and then you track one terminal with the slip knot conformation across the twisted loop. And so this was very nice, because even the successful rate of this, prot of this simulation is 2%, is telling you that you can self-tide the protein. However, th of course, there is some other simulation that is saying that you can use no native interaction and drag the protein to the native state. Uh, so that's, I would like to mention as well. So coming back to idea of uh, twist nodes, so the same way you can fold the 6-1 protein. Exactly the successful rate of this folding uh, is even lower, but to make a for one, what you have to do, you have to twist and twist half, and then drag one termini, and then you will be fold. And in this case of six one, you have to twist one, one, and then half, and then you will go to the uh, native conformation. And this is exactly the same what we observe in the simulation. So this was done with the Peter Vilnau. That was somehow his idea. So just let's move. Uh, so uh, we cannot fold the uh, big knotted protein, but we can try to fold the smallest one. So the smallest one, and it was folded already by a few people here. Um, so in this case, this is the smallest knotted protein, and it's possible to use the structure-based model. So this is the moment that you're dragging the C terminal with the slip knot conformation. But you can create something what we call the free energy landscape. And from this free energy landscape, you can assume that the main rate limiting step is to go over this topological barrier. And there are two possible ways. However, um, what is the conclusion of this results is that um, structure-based model, again, is not perfect. Uh, but it's allowing you to have a good statistic. So you can sample the data, you can create the thermodynamics data. But when you're going across this uh, twisted loop, what you have, you have a lot of no native interaction. And so there is a basic question, if you really sample correctly this uh, intermediate states where the, this no native co contacts are present by the repulsive interaction in the structure-based model. So you can claim that maybe they slow down 
you, and this is the reason why we cannot fold the knotted protein. So what you can use, you can use the all atom explicit solvent simulation, and in this case, uh, you can um, verify your results. So you can use the Anton machine data and run a millisecond simulation, and what you can find out you can find out if you will start with this kind of the conformation that you can indeed fold knotted protein by the slip knot or the pull conformation. So I think this is the way currently only one accessible to prove that knotted protein, or at least this one, can self tight. And just to make story uh, shorter, uh, there is the, the electrostatics interaction are mostly responsible for this threading. Uh, and this is the same kind of the native contact that I observe in the, in the Go model. So I will just maybe uh, jump. I have 20 minutes, yes? Okay, so I would like to go now to the kind of the basic uh, question. What is the function of the knotted protein? Uh, so this is something what we just uh, published, uh, I think, uh, one week ago. Uh, so. To understand the function of knotted protein, we concentrate on methylotransferase, the protein that is responsible for methylation of tRNA. And this is uh, very crucial because it's also responsible, it is essential for fidelity of protein synthesis and therefore for surviving or of organic. So if this reaction will not go, the, the cell will just uh, die. So as you know, there's uh, all methylotransferases are possessing the trefoil node, and this trefoil node uh, is exactly uh, part of the active sites where the ligand can bind. Um, however, there is another group of the protein that is uh, called uh, has a Rossmann fold, and in this case, um, uh, it's unknotted. However, the protein has exactly the same function. Uh, moreover, if you now will compare this, so this is what we will call the orthologous uh, protein. They perform exactly the same function. They are responsible for the methylation of tRNA, but one is a knotted and it's composed of dimer and is binding the uh, ligand in the band conformation. And this is in bacteria and in human and in yeast, we have unknotted content part that it's a monomer and it's binding the ligand in the open conformation. So I think it's a perfect tool to compare what is the advantage of not if we have two uh, protein, they prefer the same function. So then you can ask a question, uh, what is the ligand, why the ligand is bound in the knotted protein? Uh, why we have the hom why the knotted protein is homodomeric when the, the another one is uh, uh, just monomer? And um, so to solve this uh, or to learn about the difference between those two proteins, we combine the experiment with the theoretical results. So we choose, uh, based on the sequence alignment, we choose 15 different amino acids inside the knotted core of the protein, outside the knotted core, and those that are, are responsible for tRNA binding. And then when you mutate those amino acids, then you can do the same kind of the mutation in the computers. You can calculate the free energy and you can compare the results with, exp uh, with those from the experiment. And what I'm showing you, I'm showing you here the experimental results. So we measure three things. We measure the uh, 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 methylation transfer, so how fast the reaction will go. We will measure the, if the binding uh, tRNA will change, and we will measure the binding of ligand. And as we expected, some amino acids that are responsible for the binding ter for binding RNA, if you mutate them, there's a huge difference. However, there is some mutation that are very surprised. So for example, this mutation at amino acid 115, because this amino acid is not in direct contact either with the ligand, nor with tRNA, and not really responsible, it shouldn't be responsible for the methylation. So, however, what you see here, if we mutate this amino acid, there is surprisingly a uh, decrease uh, in methylation process. So this uh, is why we use as well the simulation. So now if you use the implicit solvent simulation with all ions, and it will be the most realistic simulation that you can perform for uh, 500 uh, milliseconds, uh, 10 different simulations, you can prove they are converging. 
then you can observe that mutation of this amino acid is destroying the network of hydrogen bonds interaction that are responsible for the methylation process. So this implies that the no amino acids in the ligand, they are indirectly responsible for the transferring the signal, the free energy signal from the ligand binding to the tRNA. Additionally, you can ask additional question is uh, why we, why uh, knotted protein has a ligand in the bent conformation and a knotted one is binding the ligand in the open conformation. And then you can again explain this by the simulation. So you can, we observe in the simulation as well the open conformation of the ligand, but in this active site that is not protected by tRNA, but when we dock this ligand in the open conformation to the sites with tRNA, what you can just easy by eye recognize, it's impossible by steric crash to have the ligand in the bent conformation. So only one possible is a, uh, in the straight conformation. So you have to have the ligand in the bound conformation. However, in the case of the unknotted protein, you can have both uh, conformation. So just to one more things, and why we, why we have a knot. So then you can use this uh, ligand to try to, so if we know already that the ligand has to be in the knotted conformation to assure correct uh, free energy pairing with the with, uh, active sites, then you can ask why could we have the knotted core could be uh, unknotted. So there is one protein that was crystallized in a knotted conformation that I think is just a mistake, but it's a perfect object for me to prove uh, that uh, what or to check what will happen if we have the unknotted core. So in this case, if you will have a knotted core, it's, impo so it's possible to relax the structure to bind the ligand, but this ligand bound to uh, um, a knotted conformation will be never stable or will be not stabilized by the interaction with the some amino acids. So this is somehow a direct proof that if you will have the unknotted conformation, then indeed you can bind the ligand, but you can only bind the ligand in the straight conformation as a stable, uh, something that it will be stable. But we know from the previous picture that this straight conformation of the ligand is impossible for binding tRNA. So I will just uh, would like to mention that one of uh, idea that I have currently is we know that the ligand in a knotted core has to be bound and has to be very stable. So now we can use this idea maybe to, to design the uh, selective inhibitor. So we know the uh, methylotransferase in human are a knotted one, but in bacteria there are knotted one. So maybe we can use the silicon that we know that has to be really in the bound conformation. We can stabilize this bound conformation and then extend this and create something what it will be the selective inhibitor to block uh, bacterial methylotransferase. But now I would like to jump to uh, the LASSO uh, project. So um, if you will, this is just the uh, protein with the NNC terminal, but then you can see that some protein, as you know, they, they have the uh, cysteine bridge. And if you, you make the cysteine bridge, then you can ask the question if there will be uh, any type of the protein when you will have one of the terminal that will be dragged across this loop. And this is uh, coming back to the, I think yesterday talks about the minimal surface. So to detect the last protein, I'm using idea of minimal surface. Um, so uh, we, to find out what is the surface spanned on our covalent loop, we, we consider this, what I just said, this minimal surface, and then we analyze the intersection of this, uh, intersection of one of the tail with uh, this surface. So this is, let's say, the ideal minimal surface, and this is something what we will see in protein. And our algorithm is very simple. Uh, we determine initial set of vertex and then repeat minimize, uh, minimize uh, area around each vertex and minimize area and edge swapping. So uh, this is example of two surface and this is somehow uh, spanned on the same uh, bound on the same um, edge. 
uh, and what you can see here, this is slightly bigger than this one. So we are looking for the minimal surface that will look like this, and this is the superposition on the protein. So this is not what we would like to see. We would like to see the minimal surface that looks in such way. And so uh, with this method, then we can, uh, that is as well the idea of a uh, soft bubble, we can um, scan the PDB and then we can answer the question if there is some other protein, they have the last so topology. And uh, we found there is at least, as you can see, 18% uh, of the protein deposit in the PDB from non redundant set that uh, is uh, possessing a slip knot topology. So, whether now I could uh, ask you how complex can be a last so protein? So they are quite complex. Uh, so we have the last, so what we will call that we have one tail that is dragged across the loop just once, that we call the single lasso. We have some protein that you have the, this tail is dragged uh, on, um, it's similar to the slip knot, so we call this double lasso. Sometimes you have the triple lasso. However, what it was the most surprising for me that we find something what we call the super calling. So in this case, you have one tail that is dragged uh, across the loop and then one on across the loop, then it's going back from the other side and back from the other side. So I think I call this super calling. It's, I don't know if it's the best name, but it's uh, something that reminds me. And of course, we have something what we call the uh, two sides uh, last so. Uh, so uh, this is one of the example of super calling protein that what I, maybe this is why I have in mind the, to call this super calling. So this is the, our protein. Then you can see where is the system bridge. This is our minimal surface that is spanned on the covalent loop. And this is another kind of the representation to see where we, uh, baricentric representation, where we see uh, last so. So all the, because it's impossible to explain you now all the last so protein and the super calling and they're really interesting. So we make the, the server uh, where you can find all uh, last so protein. And I can tell you that the, the highest one is we have protein that you have one day that is dragged at least six times across the loop. And the most super calling protein is with the three times dragging. So the visual, visualization is similar as in the not prod, just that you will get to used to. Uh, so we have the protein, and then on the protein you have the minimal surface that is spanned. Then you can see all the information about the crossing, uh, direction of the crossing, the size of the tail, so to see if it's shallow or deep, and everything is well, as well as uh, projected on the sequence. So just to finish, so this is what we built currently. This is our kind of the evolutional topological tree. And what is surprise, you don't see all the topology here. So I don't know, this is something that it's still not crystallized because it's just too difficult. Or the, as we know from Sophie, there are some, only, some group of the protein that are crystallized and to make, probably to make protein that are more complex, you need to bigger protein and they are a little more difficult. But what you can see here, this is the, zero last, so then you can have um, L1 and minus one. So I use just the product vector to see if it's from the sur above the surface or below. So we have all the protein with two crossings. So you can have uh, double last, so you can have uh, slip knot, and you, as well you can have the super calling. However, if you go a uh, level up with the three crossing, the blue one is what we have currently and the gray one is what I did not find in the, uh, in the PDB. So this is just the accident or this is the evolution. I think this is kind of the open question. However, we know that there's other protein that are more complex like the, with the four crossing or even with the seven crossing. But we do not have some special cases. So this is definitely the open subject to classify it and to really there's a lot of question that uh, to answer, okay, I have five minutes. Uh, so just to uh, make this, uh, so one of the things that I find interesting about also the last so protein and the knotted protein, most of the knotted protein are enzyme, but it's exactly opposite in the case of the last so protein. Last so protein are uh, rather a signaling protein or uh, antibacterial 
protein, but there are not enzymes. However, what you can see here, we, with the single lasso, it's very characteristic for anti uh, antimicrobial protein, and they are also very commonly used for the drug design, and the slip node kind of the conformation is characterized for the signaling protein. I do not have currently proof if this is the topology that is uh, deciding about function, but this is, I think, something to explore. Uh, okay, so there is a different type of the amino acid that you can close, and one of the most common uh, exam that it was found uh, definitely before our discovery, and this is why I call this last, so not the tadpole, as Tesuto was calling, because this is a very old protein that is uh, uh, used to block uh, polymerase, that you have one tail that is crossing across the surface, and then you have two bulky amino acids that are uh, blocking this. So this is kind of the historical reason why I'm using the last name, not the tadpole uh, name. So maybe I will just skip the Mm. other function, but now I would like to ask you a final question. Do we have links in protein? And there is one nice paper that I recently learned as well about the links, so it was done independently. So our definition of the last, so is we, if we think about the links in the protein, then we can distinguish between two types of the links. We can have the deterministic links that will be closed by, uh, in this case, by the cysteine bridge, so you can have one single protein chain and on this one single protein chain, you can have two uh, system bridge. However, the loop uh, in this case will be crossed by the another loop. So this is what I will call deterministic links. This is another example of the deterministic links made by two chains, but independently they are close to each other. And this is the approximation of the uh, probabilistic links. So we have two chains, but we will close them uh, independently. So to, uh, to find out if protein has links, uh, I will use uh, the, as previous the idea of the minimal surface. So this is kind of the representation of the protein with the N-terminal, C-terminal. And in this case, uh, we can have the classification based on the chirality and the orientation because we have both the orientation of the loop and we know how the one loop is pursing across another one. And then we can span the minimal surface on one loop and then see if the surface is crossed by another loop. So, um, so this is our minimal surface, and this is the results. So currently in the PDB, this is the links, the deterministic links. So we have the Hopf uh, deterministic link that is one of the, uh, it's, I choose this protein because it's the smallest one, so it's very nicely packed and it's very beautiful. And then almost by eyes, you can see the hop link. There's slightly other uh, bigger protein as well with the hop link. Currently, we know that the single protein chain can make also the salmon link. And we have the boremian link. So something that uh, I think definitely needs to be explored more. And, but what, it has to be explored more because it's not really easy to determine this. So this is the simple explain example of the link. However, if you will have such structure that you have one loop that is dragged by across another one, but there's some <coughs> other loops, or in this case that something is additionally twisting, that's something probably what I need more help uh, from theoretician. Or as well here, this is a very nice example that they can be quite complex. So just to finish, um, something what I find very interesting that as in the last protein, it was difficult to assign one function. In the case of the link, there is a unique correlation between the Salomon links and exactly the same biological function. So that's something that there is no, or maybe there is not enough protein, but all Salomon links has, are exactly adhesive protein. So to determine the probabilistic links, we close the two termini of the protein on the sphere. There is a different method what I learned uh, uh, two days ago from our Landini paper. Uh, so it will be very good to compare this. So currently you can just go online because I cannot talk about all of those, but we have online server that we call as well LinkProt, where you can find all the information about the both type of the links deterministic and probabilistic. So this is the current classification. This is deterministic links. However, in the case of the probabilistic links, we make an additional slider. So this slider 
Okay, so there's, if Sophie cannot see because, <laughs> so in the case of the probabilistic links, you determine the probability which you will have a type of link. So because we don't know what is the, what to say, if it's 60% of the probability that this will be linked, or maybe 50, so then you can rather just decide by yourself. I would like to see all the links in a protein, they have at least 10% of the probability to exist, or I would like to see the links that have at least 80% of the probability to exist. So this uh, slider will change all this table, and we currently go up to four uh, chains. So that's zero minute. Uh, okay, I'm finishing. And I, I think it's necessary to say that this server uh, and, uh, was built with the uh, crucial help of Ken Millet and uh, Eric Radvan. I will be not able to classify all these links without their help. So, and as before, uh, now you can have minimal surface. This is HV protein that you can see that it's linked. And I think it's the same uh, as in Orlandini paper. But then you can have all this interactive cycle that it's telling you what is the probability that you will see the, the hop link, unlink, and all others. So we go up to 1% of the probability. So I will just finish with the, something what I am working currently now. I would like to classify the macro links. So this is the virus, as you hear about before, that the DNA, RNA is packed. But you could ask the question why the virus is so stable. And I believe it's so stable because there is links inside. Uh, they are stabilized this uh, structure. And the highest link, what I found, I call the flower link. So this is something to explore. So just to finish, there's a lot of application. And this is, I think, the most uh, complex knotted, slip knotted linking protein in the PDB. And I will just finish, not to stress Eric. Uh, so uh, the function about knotted protein is work what it was done with my PhD student, with Agata Perlinska. Alexandra Yarmoniska is responsible for most of the server, and she's amazing. Uh, Pavel is classifying all the nodes, and he's also amazing. And Vanda is uh, the first person that I start to collaborate after my uh, postdoc. Uh, so this is my group and all my collaboration. And I uh, have some source of the money, so I am looking for a good postdoc or PhD if somebody will be interesting. Thank you.